Okay, so we're recording. So hello, this is the community call, a very select group of people on today's call. Uh, only the best looking people are allowed in this call uh, on, what's the date? On the 18th of June, 2024. Uh, so I'm the ugly one, I'm Nicholas, and I'm going to be the chair today. Uh, I'm looking at the document over here, which is the agenda. Uh, everybody's been here before, so we don't really need to do introductions. Um, so I'll go on to announcements, and there is only one announcement, and I put that down as the item in the announcement, and that is that uh, uh, there's going to be a new release of PyScript later this week, uh, probably Thursday or Friday, depending on when we've managed to shoehorn in all the features we want and write the documentation and do all of those sorts of things <coughs> as well. Um, so uh, that's that's coming um, soon. Uh, so be be uh, be on the lookout for that. So now we have um, agenda items as well. Uh, so again, uh, we have three agenda items. Um, I've got one. Andrea has one, and then I have another one. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, MicroPython top level awaits. Um, so what do I mean by that? Perhaps if I share my screen. Um, bum, 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 screens, entire screen for text readability. So hopefully you can all see my screen. And if I go to here, uh, you'll be able to see some PyScript code. So essentially what I've been doing as part of my invent work is working out what sort of patterns in Python we can use to uh, wrap around uh, the built-in browser-based APIs. And um, this being uh, the web, of course, uh, these browser-based APIs uh, are not exactly uniform um, and have grown organically, which is a polite way of saying it's mostly a mess and everything's a law unto itself, basically. But essentially, there are two approaches. There is, uh, you, uh, it's mostly async, um, and when you're working with an asynchronous API, uh, usually you await a result, which is easy for us to wrap in Python. But sometimes you get an API which uh, works with callbacks. And so the one I've been working with here is the speech recognition one here. Um, so we get a, a recognition object. Uh, I'm trying to get a result. Um, and what you do is you attach some callbacks, okay, uh, on, uh, on the recognition OK, and then uh, what you would do in JavaScript is you would handle the result in those callbacks. But we want to be able to await everything because that's kind of like the Pythonic way, um, await the result of this thing. So how do we turn these event, uh, these uh, callback based uh, APIs into event driven ones? Well, there is built into AsyncIO a sort of class called event. OK, and what we can do is we can await on that event, okay, and in the callbacks, what we can do is we can say that uh, this finished event is actually been set. It's it's good to go. We've actually finished. At which point, this unawaits. We uh, it's called reentrance here, um, and we return the result over here, which hopefully has been set here in the on result um, callback. So that's essentially how it looks. How do you use it? You literally just await, listen. Um, in this example. Um, now, while writing this, I, I did this with Pyodide and it worked fine. Uh, I went to MicroPython and it didn't. And it turns out that uh, if you await something that also itself awaited a, an async IO primitive, such as an async IO dot event, um, then MicroPython uh, wouldn't work properly. So I'm just highlighting this because I wanted to say uh, how much of a star Damien is. Uh, let me just stop sharing. Uh, because uh, in a matter of about 48 hours, <laughs> he's uh, come up with a solution and now that actually works. So we're good to go with that sort of API. And hopefully once we've figured out the idioms of how you wrap these browser APIs in Python, we can just sort of build them out uh, into the PyScript.web namespace um, so folks can uh, make use of those wonderful APIs. Um, they're quite rich, the APIs that we have there as well. Um, so it's not just speech recognition, there's text-to-speech as well, so it'll talk at you. There's things like compasses and geolocation <coughs> and all sorts of really good stuff as well. Um, 
but uh, including also database storage, which is a wonderful segue into the next point, which is Andrea, who's going to be uh, describing a new item we've added to the PyScript name space called PyScript.storage. So, Andrea, the floor is yours, matey. Thanks. Um, I will start sharing my screen. So, yep. It should be good. All right. Yep. We can see it. Again. So, what I want to talk today is about these. Well, Nicholas spoiled it. It's PyScript storage. Um, it was an idea from this morning, actually. <laughs> and um, turns out I implemented um, a very simple, lovely way to deal with IndexedDB. Uh, there are dozen wrappers around IndexedDB, um, but IndexedDB fundamentally is a key value store. And all these wrappers did not expose a key value store like API. What's the key value store like API in JavaScript? That's a map. So map has get key, has key, set key, clear, or um, keys, values, entries, instead of uh, items in Python. Um, and that's it. So I simply imported the module, uh, did some change because Arguably, if you have a map API, but all the methods are asynchronous, it's going to be slightly uh, more awkward to, to, to deal with it. Um, and so the idea was to have this instead. So you still await the storage to populate itself whenever there was some key stored later on in the code um, and so that you have that key the next time. And uh, he has a sites. So this is a, in this case, I'm, I'm demoing the easy way to do it. It's just expose a storage that automatically bootstraps. Um, I can show you how. Um, this is the storage. This is the PyScript module. This is the async dev storage that if it has a name, it's going gonna, it's gonna to use the name as, a, as argument zero. And then it returns um, this storage API uh, which is synchronous-like, but it does asynchronous things behind the scenes. So we we have a unique name, in this case, our own namespace. By default, we're going to create a storage called PyScript Core. Um, and this is the demo. And so I'm, I'm going here to create PyScript Core. I'm going to check the size. I'm going to set a key value thing, all synchronous, so that I can also right away print. I actually need the async in here only to be sure that I can bootstrap the storage. And eventually here I could do, if I do, if I do set or clear or do heavier operations in, term, in terms of writing instead of reading, I can do um, await, await, uh, store, sync. And that's it. And when this happens, I'm sure that whatever happened before or previously, <laughs> um, it's persistent. So demo page, uh, I have um, this page, I'm going to refresh the first time. So I, I cleared all the all the data in, in my browser. I'm going to refresh and it's going to be zero because I'm printing the store sites. Um, and then I'm going to do store set key value, store get key, and that returns value. Next time I refresh, I should read one because the store is persistent in the user, um, browser, tab, domain, whatever, however you want to call it. And, um, and that's it. That's the, the easy way. And Nicholas all, always gives me great suggestions, hints, and, and, and ideas. And it was like, how about we make it more Pythonic? Because this is still... Python code, we're running Python code, we're exporting a module functionality into Python. And so that's that was my next attempt, um, which is different. So this is the Pythonic approach. And I need to um, comment out this because I'm not going to use this. I'm going to use this instead. And I will show you what is that? So 
Now we have a storage.py, which is um, uh, a Python dict. Literally, if you if you see the code, the class storage it extends dict. So there's nothing different from a dict. There's some interceptor behind the scene. So the dict is uh, fully synchronous. Um, but of course, there are these cases where we want to delete an item or set an item. These are cases that should be reflected into the store so that into the JavaScript index db store so that the next time is going to be is going to be synchronized and we have a clear as well to remove all the entries from the store and uh, the only asynchronous extra method is actually sync so that whenever you do a lot of heavy writings you can eventually do await sync everything else doesn't need to be awaited simply because we await the storage when we create it and then we create the dictionary out of all its entries. So the storage, the store is resolved ahead of time and whenever it's returned is already known as a dictionary and all the entries are already there. Now, before I can run this code instead, uh, but I can show you at least this code. Um, maybe I can show you better. Um, yeah, that, oh, that works. So this is the Python code I'm running, um, and it, it feels and look hopefully a bit more Pythonic, uh, but I also need to build it. Mm, come on, it's built, yay. Uh, so now what we're gonna see, let me clear again the application all the data I have in here. So what we're gonna see, let's walk through this example. We await the storage. We could pass a name. So if you want from PyScript create your, your your own thing as a storage name, it's gonna work. So you have your own private namespace as a storage and still uh, with a at PyScript slash prefix, but you can literally write your name and decide that your storage shouldn't be reachable, cleared, or should it be in everyone else's hands when it comes to the same domain uh, or same site uh, running multiple scripts, who knows? Now, we're going to check the length of the store. So these are all dictionaries, well-known things. Uh, we're going to iterate the store. If, if there is any length, we're going to see the key and value. Um, we're going to set a value, in this case a random value, which is literally a random call. Um, a key value, this is static, it's just for demo purpose. And now we see we're going to check the land store again. You can see nothing is asynchronous here. We are working with a dictionary. The land is going to be two here for sure. And then we're going to print all the values. Then we're going we're gonna to just remove one store key or if we want, we could remove all the keys and values and then we can print after land store and for key in store and we're gonna see what happens here that there then we sync and we just this is for integration test sake if no error happened uh, we're gonna have an okay in the page um, we consider that good result so i'm gonna refresh this was the first time so before there were zero entries now there are two entries a random value a key value then if you remember i delete the store key and so right after i delete that this the len is one and the random remains is exactly the same now we're gonna see when i refresh that's the persistency the the, the persistent part of the of the store when i refresh that's gonna be before we had that same very same value there and now we have new values a new random still the key value and after the, the latest random we set, and I can go on forever. So it's gonna be the number you see here is gonna be the first one that was there before. And when you see this, it means that everything is already synced and I can refresh quickly. So I can actually con control error as much as I like and it's gonna always show the right thing. So the last number here is gonna be the next number here Problem. and so on and so forth. Problem. And that's it. Problem. So this is, to me, super simple. Um, there is one <laughs> tiny caveat um, that I would like to talk. Um, so everything works wonderfully, but 
If we don't go with the JavaScript version, and at this point, I'm pretty sure this Pythonic version with a dictionary is way better. There is one extra detail um, that we somehow address with the fetch module, what well, we are not addressing here. So that might complicate a bit things. So first of all, I'm ignoring on purpose all the magic in Python that allows me eventually to do uh, store key equal value because I can intercept that, but at the dictionary level, mm -hmm. this doesn't change the land and this doesn't necessarily show up while iterating. And so I'm not sure I should do that. This might be under discussion, but I think it should be as close to a dictionary as possible without without too much magic. So this yeah. can go to me. Yes. What cannot go is, is actually when we set an item, if this value is a Python buffer or RA view or a buffer view, um, we should probably convert it out of the box into something that JavaScript can store. That's something I haven't tested yet. I'm not sure how JavaScript IndexedDB will store a Python buffer. So I think what we are missing is some conversion uh, back and forward when it comes to this value. And then we need to eventually be sure that when we get item back, we also return the previously stored array buffer um, as a Python buffer. Yeah. So this is the only, probably the only missing things because when it comes to IndexedDB, it understands not just strings, not just numbers or immutable values. It understands also uh, buffers, blobs and files and eventually images or whatever we want to store in there. So from f for me, this is um, a great foundation for yeah. the store, for the store. Um, but we need to tackle all the possible caveats in terms of um, what kind of value we want to be able to store from the Python world and how do we want to convert this. Because we have example, if you want to store an image, right away we have the display magic that converts the image into something compatible that, that can be displayed on the web. But we also need some extra logic to being able to uh, convert that item, in that image into something else as a blob and then eventually returns it exactly as it was before. So there's a lot of things that yeah. could be converted back and forward, and I don't want to blow this class too much, but inevitably we need to um, think about this because uh, right now this store works, works wonderfully. It might work perfectly if you just use the FFI to JS and you just pass the, the buffer and it converts automatically into something that JS understands. But you have also to remember to from that JS to convert it back to Python. <laughs> so probably our users, because it's Pythonic, would expect just to store a buffer, get the buffer, and that and that's it. So yeah. this is the only uh, open question, but not necessarily a blocker for the initial storage release so, to me. So, but, so uh, yeah. So, so I have a question. Uh, well, first of all, um, really great work uh, with this. Um, this. Uh, in the same way that fetch and WebSockets uh, work the same way in PyDyne and MicroPython, um, the same goes for uh, the you know the, the index DB storage um, thing going on here. Which um, just for people who don't know, this is different to local storage, uh, which is another key value store. Uh, but I think you only get five megs, is it, uh, of, of storage? Uh, with local storage but with index db you can store a, a, a lot more in there um i just that the question you touched on the question i was going to have which is what type of thing can you store as a value in index db because you know i've read the docs and i know you can store arbitrary data in there but i was wondering what that might look like in terms of somebody using pyscript if i had like a python dictionary and I was storing that as a value against a key. Uh, I'm assuming that, um, <laughs> well, I don't know what would happen. Um, it, it will happen at, at 2JS <laughs> from our side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever that means, because you can store, I have to check if maps, if, if there is some map conversion, but maybe we should be explicit there and we are already explicit there for dictionaries. So lists or tuples are going to be stored as an array. 
And um, yeah, that, that's the thing. They have to be retrieved back the way yeah. people and expect. Then, uh, you don't want, you don't want the just yeah, yeah. a JS proxy, a JS proxy uh, back when you when you ask for yeah. for that. So okay. I, we can I use think... also JSON JSON dump for yeah. for most yeah you know, exactly type. That's it. So <laughs> that's actually probably is also going to be faster yeah. because it's native in, in in Python. We have a Python thing that's going to be. Uh, yeah. The, the, the question is, what if you try to store a JS proxy <laughs> of... Uh, I was a, just going to say, if I, I imagine there are going to be some advanced users who want to, in a sense, um, not pickle, but do you know what I mean? Pickle uh, an object yeah. and store it away into, uh, in, into there and then unpickle it um, uh, when they need it later on. Um, and that would be interesting. Oh, both as a J, JS proxy and a PyScript proxy proxy as well and then what happens if you know you you, you know you've got a complete you, you know you're revisiting the website in a completely different tab um you, you know that there's a whole bunch of state related things going on um what i'm thinking is that we should just write down a list of things that we want yeah. to reliably deal with being able to store but, but also we, we shouldn't be that, afraid that, to say these things you want to store these you're an idiot <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, because uh, that's going to gonna be complicated for us, and we don't want to make complicated things. Okay, we no, we're going to throw an simple. error, and it's going to be yeah, yeah, incompatible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. incompatible type. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's sensible because it's the same in JavaScript. I mean, yeah. if somebody tries to store the document body, <laughs> that, that makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. In exactly. exactly. So, it, it's it's, it's, grace, error, it's being so... graceful about it, isn't it, Andre? But I, I mean, yeah. uh, you yeah. you said it as well. Um, this is a good first step. Um, people can watch the video, they can comment and move from fine and, you know, um, and make sure that we get the, the thing that we need. I know certainly that the Invent project will be using this work uh, because it's it, it solves a, a, a whole bunch of problems. Well, uh, and it's, it's because I was talking about Invent with Andrea this morning uh, that we got onto this subject. And hey, presto, by the end of the working day, Web Yoda has used his force powers to, to take the X wing out of let's the Let's start with Invent then. Let's start with yeah, yeah. Invent. Let's see, see how that works. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's cover that, yeah, yeah. and then we can refine and improve. So yeah. at least we have something to start yeah. with and use it. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, I'm going to move on because I can see we've we've been going for yeah. 25 minutes. I'm going to move on to the the last item which uh, was proposed by me, um, and. Um, uh, that item is called GitHub Code Spaces with PyScript. Now, we have a wonderful friend of PyScript called Professor Chris Rogers of Tufts University. And uh, he emailed me uh, in the early hours of this morning going, I've got this error and blah, blah, blah. And I helped him fix it. And then he said, oh, and have you seen Code Spaces? Wouldn't it be cool if PyScript worked with GitHub Code Spaces? And I was like, what the hell are code spaces and things like that? So um, for, well, two or three hours today, I was looking at this because he said, could we get PyScript in code spaces um, so his students could use them? So I'm just going to um, share my screen again. Um, so screen, this entire screen, go live. OK, so if I go here, that's PyScript.com. So uh, the answer isn't that. The answer is this. <laughs> so I've read the documentation and I've botched together something called Code Spaces Project Template PyScript. Um, and what does this do? Well, it allows you to launch a PyScript based editor in GitHub itself. OK, uh, I started from a JavaScript based version of this. OK, and the readme reflects this. And I've taken some of the original readme and I've also written bits of my own. But this basically explains how you do stuff. And because we're in GitHub, it will be you, you can host it on GitHub pages or, or use Azure and things like that. But essentially what code spaces are is a development environment in your browser. So if I start a code space from this, uh, it'll take a sec uh, it'll take maybe about thirty seconds to start up. Um, so what you're looking at now is uh, Visual Studio Code starting in my browser. 
Uh, behind the scenes, there is a Docker image, presumably running in a Kubernetes cluster uh, in Microsoft's Azure, uh, that's starting up with a whole bunch of configuration, which I'll talk about in a minute when I tell you how I've got this working. Um, but eventually, uh, what we'll get, let's just see what are the logs telling us. Uh, yeah, okay, it's it's doing a whole bunch of uh, Dockery type things um, to, to get things set up. But what we'll get in the end is a development environment with everything that you need to write a PyScript app. And I'm going to keep talking because I'm waiting for stuff to happen. It was working just before this meeting happened. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Okay, all sorts of things are happening and we finished configuring it and stuff's going to appear and all of that sort of good stuff. And I should be dropped into a terminal um, where I'll be able to see the local file system and uh, it's all doing stuff. So it's given me the readme already, but this is our template app. It would it should look rather familiar for those of you who are used to PyScript.com. Um, uh, because uh, it has the same um, files, a main.py and index.html and a config.json. So index.html looks just like you would expect it to. There's a MPY type script tag. Um, but hey, look at all of this. Uh, all the Visual Studio Code stuff works. Isn't that awesome? Uh, main.py, we've got uh, the Python mode uh, working here. Um, so it should just work. Um, boom, boom. Yep, this is great. Let me just return an F string of hello. Oops. World, you can see I'm a really advanced Visual Studio Code user. Um, so I can do well, stuff like that. You want to name and not work. Ah. Yeah, thank you. That was, co that was GitHub Copilot, by the way. Uh, the disembodied voice with the Italian accent. So the AI has got so advanced now that, uh, uh, that, that, that you can make it sound like your colleagues. Um, but having said that, I have integrated Copilot into this, should you be on the Copilot scheme as well. So Copilot will, will, will help you do all of this sort of stuff as well. So I can save this or, or delete it. Um, because we're in GitHub, my code is being synced and I can see, you know, uh, I've, I've got a whole bunch of changes, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the cool thing. Um, I can also go view the code. So go live, starting. It's going to take me to it. And we should just see print hello world. Here we are. Um, Does it take the index.html by, by default? Yes, or... yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. Um, or I could just go open with live server. And there we go. Or even better, I could look at that and open to the side with, oh, no. Josh, what was it again? How do I do it? Open with live server to the side. I want to see it to the side. Um, there's a way of doing it. Um, I can't hear you if you're talking to me. Um, oh, well, Josh, uh, we'll figure it out. But the important thing is that it's all just there and it just works and it's in GitHub and you're going to be able to use it and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you're only allowed a certain number of code spaces. OK, so if you go to github.com code spaces and you're logged in, you'll be able to see the code spaces that you have open. Um, so these are the ones I've got. Uh, I've got one that's, uh, that I was using for testing an hour ago, and then I've got this thing here as well. Um, so uh, how does it work? Well, essentially, <laughs> this is your GitHub repo. Um, okay, and in the .dev container, uh, there's a JSON file uh, that contains not a lot of configuration uh, because as I read through the docs, I realized we don't really need that much when it comes to PyScript. It's just static assets that are being served by a web server. Um, and that really is it. Um, and so you can use your kind of GitHub flow and Visual Studio Code and it just works and you've got kind of all the collaborative stuff going. Because here's the thing, what GitHub have done is they've made themselves uh, into, let me just stop streaming. Not only is it the place where everybody kind of stores all their code and works on their code and collaborates, but they've built a kind of a framework around GitHub such that you can start to deliver via the browser um, developer tools uh, such as Visual Studio, uh, VS Code, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and now they've made it easy for you to be able to configure it through code spaces so you can have particular sorts of development environment. And all I did, it took me maybe about an hour to make the damn thing work 
for the first time. Since then, I've been just been refining it and tidying it. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it just took an hour to, to make that work. Um, what's even more interesting is that you don't actually have to have... Uh, Martin, you've just missed... <laughs> It's the demo. What you uh, you don't actually have to use VS Code as your editor. You could use a JetBrains thing. Uh, they've got in the deep dive docs how you actually implement your own tooling around the GitHub repo that's uh, uh, under source control that you're working with. So when it comes to Invent, for instance, we should be able to use Invent tooling if we want to integrate that into Code Spaces. So. Uh, that's it. Um, Martin, I just showed them everything I showed you about an hour ago, basically, um, is all you need to know. Um, and so that's the last item um, uh, for the meeting as well. Are there any questions or comments about that? Zoe? You're muted. Sorry, you're muted. Can you hear me? Perfect. There we go. Loud and clear. Yeah, I'm unable to deploy Pi Terminal in my GitHub. Uh, you mean? Um, let me try. And well, you just you just use a you just use the Pi. So what the, the template from Nicholas should work, right, for the Pi Terminal? So if I go look at my browser, um, so here we have index.html. Okay, we've got Minikoi as well. So we should have all that stuff. So I've got terminal here. Okay, and if I look at this, it's going to serve it with Hello World. Okay, let me try something a bit more advanced and see what happens. So here, uh, let's put it in a worker. Okay, uh, it's gonna no, you, don't, you don't need you don't need that with MicroPython. So you can just import code, code, yeah, uh, interactive. Yeah, yeah. Ah, you want so you want ah right. Okay, so you want so Zobi, tell me if I've got this right. So import code, and then uh, that's that's VS Code. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> Import code. It's because we're in an HTML file. That's what it is. Uh, so code dot interact. Yeah. Interactive. Remove the source. Yeah, that's it. So I'm doing that. So that should work. And so if I now go visit this, there we go. There you go. There we are. It works for me in PyScript, but not uh, my own GitHub. Ah, that's probably the coin missing. That's because probably you need to put this what I've got online for here. Um, just in the... can you try the worker, uh, Nicholas, please, just yeah, to be sure of that because say... you're, you're running mini coins from the root of the server, so yeah. I'm not sure it's gonna work. You should put a dot before that slash, it works. Yeah. Even uh, Pi Editor, uh, it doesn't show in my GitHub, Pi Editor. Ah, right. Okay. Like, the things which come from source, what? Doesn't... Yeah, it's still Minikoi. Pi Editor runs in a worker, so you still need that top script Minikoi. Yeah. So in GitHub pages, you cannot change headers, so you need to, you need to put bring your own headers through, yeah. through service workers. But that's that's the key to uh, unlock you. I hope. If I include this, it will work. Yes. Yes. Mini so that, okay. and you need the script. The script physically, you need the script in your project. So the mini code JS, yes. as you can see. Like yes. So it needs to be here in your okay. project as well, like that. Um, so let me just. You can use a dot slash mini code JS or just mini code JS. So if it's in the same folder, you are sure that it's not going to try to reach up. Yeah. Uh, because if it tries to reach up, is is not going to work. In this case, the the, the 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 slash works because the the domain is created a doc for that project only, so it, it works like a root. But if you are in GitHub Pages, you might have multiple um, sub sub projects, and so you need to remember to use dot slash minikoi js or just minikoi js, which still loads from the current uh, page and not from the 
uh, and uh, parent folder, uh, which is not going to work. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, but so, but, uh, as I know you do, because I see you regularly on Discord. Uh, just keep asking questions, and it's wonderful to see you asking questions as well. Because here's the thing: by asking the questions, you're helping the next person who comes along with your problem, because they'll start searching the conversation and they'll come up with your question and the answer so it's it's a helpful thing to ask questions so so please keep asking questions it's a wonderful thing to do um so you know i'm i'm actually saying thank you for asking questions there because it, it, it helps us out there um okay is there anything else that we need to discuss uh, apart from a note to chris who's watching on youtube um in about i don't know when he kicks off for the day uh you know um i will i i sent you the link via email go play with it break it you know give it to your kids let them break it and feedback most welcome um anything else otherwise i'll stop the meeting for me it's done silence just... <laughs> is it gone I will just share in the Discord channel uh, the link to the docs because there is a, um, there's not a full example, but at least it explains how MiniCoy.js works and yeah. uh, how you should use it. Um, and hopefully that helps. Yeah. Yes. Yes. If you look in docs.pyscript.net under web workers, there's a whole section about MiniCoy and uh, headers and things like that. So, okay. I'm going to stop the meeting. And bum bum.